Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm Father Mitch Paquin. Welcome to EWTN Live, where we bring you guests from all over the world. And we've got a great conversation coming up with Susan Tassoni. You've had her here before many times. We'll be talking about how you can live every day, each day, with divine mercy through the spirituality of St. Faustina Kowalska. Before we get to that conversation, I want to briefly talk about what's happening with some of the top news stories over at the National Catholic Register. And for that, we welcome the Register's Editor-in-Chief, Jeanette DeMello. Hi, Father. Jeanette, are you here to do talk about the news or talk about advertising some of those weight loss programs? <laughs> the last time you were here, you had some... You're sort of some extra, out there. yeah, some extra weight. I you, was you, nine. You dropped about eight, <laughs> nine pounds. Oh yeah, it? yeah. I was nine pounds. <laughs> nine pounds. No, I was <laughs> nine months pregnant. Right. I had the baby a, a week later. Uh, a, a plump little boy, Samuel. His name. So you're going to keep him? I'm going to keep him. All right, good. His his brothers like, like him, so he's, oh, good. he's good, 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 the good. third boy. Great. So, Congratulations. So, yeah. Congratulations. Definitely Congratulations. feeling a little lighter. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but this is related to the issue because we've got a big issue mm -hmm. in the news going on where a number of states are going for late-term abortion. That's right. And infanticide. They want to kill That's babies. Right. That's right. Beyond what Roe v. Wade had said. Right. Tell us about what's going on. So we've on. got states like New York uh, yes. who have already passed bills that expand uh, late-term abortion. Uh, and you and know, infanticide. And infa they, they, they can, essentially, right, born, right. If the baby's born alive, they, they do not have to uh, take care of that baby. They can let that baby die. Yep. And so, uh, yeah, that's the extreme. We've got places like Rhode Island that are trying to uh, fight uh, to codify Roe versus Wade. Um, there's argument over whether they will go to the extreme of New York or mm -hmm. they'll just codify what Roe versus Wade allows. Because Roe versus Wade allows abortion up until the time the child is out of the womb. That's right. But once the child is out of the womb, then the Supreme Court said we can call them a person, but not <laughs> crazy. before then. It's crazy, yeah. right. So we have states who are trying to do this, but one of the, the most interesting things that the register is covering right now, aside from these states who are doing the extreme, there are about 304, according to the Guttemacher Institute, 304 uh, bills in state legislatures that are aiming uh, to uh, protect life actually, to yes. restrict abortion. The state of Alabama is one of them. Exactly. Uh, in fact, just yesterday, the state of Alabama said, okay, if these, these, some of these northern states are going to do the extreme and, uh, and put the extreme abortion laws on the books, we're going to do the opposite, and we're going to make sure that if Roe v. Wade is ever lifted, that abortion is illegal in our state. And mm -hmm. so that's what Alabama mm -hmm. has done uh, just yesterday. Right. Of course, Bishop Baker supported that. Right. Uh, and, you know, there are a lot of other bills um, that are called heartbeat bills. So, right. Uh, Georgia, Mississippi, uh, they just passed these heartbeat bills. Uh, basically, that once there's a heartbeat, you cannot abort the child. At six weeks of age, mm -hmm. exactly. So, at six weeks of uh, uh, age in, the, in utero. Um, now, these bills have been uh, somewhat controversial. Uh, they're, oh, yeah, Hollywood's trying to stop it because those people are all so smart. Right, <laughs> exactly, mm -hmm. exactly. So, you're referring to Georgia, which mm -hmm. is where uh, a bill just passed, but Hollywood came out and said, uh, basically, we're not going to make movies in your state if you pass this bill. Oh, so uh, we're going to stay in Hollywood. Well, that's our loss. <laughs> you're like, thanks. Yeah. <laughs> uh, keeping the South pure, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, but the bill ba passed, and the governor is expected to sign it. So, right. that's really good news. Uh, well, these are the kind of things that uh, we encourage people to get a hold of the National Catholic right. uh, 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 Register. Get it right, to, Father. Yeah, it's, I the know it. it's the it's register. It's the register. <laughs> you know, almost had a slip. Uh, National Catholic Register to keep up with this news right. and on the rights to life, you know, that, that are going on as well as other uh, issues as well. Exactly. So thank you very much. And if you want to subscribe to the National Catholic Register, go to ncregister.com, ncregister.com, or you can call at 1-800-421-3230. Thank Father. you. Appreciate, I appreciate you it. being here and I hope you keep on enjoying your new son as I well. Sure will. 
We'll be back in just a couple of minutes with tonight's guests, so please stay with us. Thank you. Welcome back. Our guest tonight is an award-winning and best-selling author who's written quite a number of books on purgatory and on praying for the <coughs> holy souls. We have a great chance to talk about those over the years. But this time, in her newest book, she decided to dig into the spirituality of the much-beloved Saint Faustina Kowalska in order to expose for us what she calls Saint Faustina's secrets of sanctity, which can awaken in us the qualities of mercy, trust, humility, and peaceful acceptance of God's will. And we all need a lot more of those things. So please welcome a good friend of the network and the author of the book, Day by Day with St. Faustina, 365 Reflections, Susan Tassoni. Father, Susan, Father, good to have you. Always good to well, see a fellow linesman. Yeah, so you're up from, uh, or down here from Sweet Home Chicago, eh? Yes, yeah. brought a little wind with me. Yeah, <laughs> well, they have plenty. I brought something else with me. What's um, that? Well, we're Loyola graduates, yes. and um, I brought you a little something from the Loyola Ramblers. Oh, yes. And it's their motto. Yeah. It's And I, you wear pins. Oh, yeah, I haven't yeah, seen one sure. lately. I thought I'd better bring you a new one. So it says worship and you lead us in phenomenal worship work. You work very hard and win. And those are the best winning cowboy boots I've ever seen. So <laughs> well, there's thank your you pin. very much. I appreciate that. So the, the, the Loyola teams are uh, called the Ramblers right. and Sister Jean, who is yeah. sort of the the, the chaplain yeah, of the chaplain. basketball team. They're cheerleader. Oh, great. Yeah, and cheerleader. Great. Well, thank you, Mark. You're welcome. Now, with uh, St. Faustina here, let's take a look at this. Why did you write a book about St. Faustina's reflections? And it was interesting, Father. Four things. Um, I uh, was ch chatting with the daughters of St. Paul, and um, I started to write this. I had an idea that I wanted to develop it more, and I was on the phone with one of the sisters and she said that people come into their store and they say they read the diary and they don't know what to do after they read the diary. Mm -hmm. I said, okay, that's interesting. Then I was doing some research and I was chatting with the shrine, uh, the, the Marian, the Stockbridge shrine, um, Divine, yeah, the Divine Mercy, Mercy shrine. shrine. Right, mm -hmm. and um, I had commented, I'm gonna be doing a day by day. And she said, are you sure you're gonna do a day by day? I said, well, I signed a contract. I'm not going to go to purgatory for this. <laughs> um, and uh, she said, because they get calls specifically asking for a day by day. Mm -hmm. I said, oh my goodness, um, that's two. Then I was chatting with some friends of mine who listened to the tape in their car, the, mm -hmm. the, on the diary on tape. And she just commented, I didn't say anything about, you know, what I heard before. And she said, you know, you know, I'm driving and I read and listen to, you know, I read, I read her diary and then I listen to it on type and she goes, it's, it's nice, but mm -hmm. I don't know what to do. Ah, that's three. Mm -hmm. And then a priest from um, the uh, Green Bay Diocese said mm -hmm. that he found it to be intimidating with the breadth and length of it. And that was four. Yeah. 
Yeah, that, and I think that that's a sense that a lot of people have. The diary is fairly long. It's very rich. Very rich. There is a lot, you know, you really can see the development from the early stages, and it's sort of something that is a little, almost sounds a little saccharine, but it quickly matures, and you see this development that as our Lord leads her, but it's so much. It's a lot. Yeah. Um, and Father, fi 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 we were here the last, what, three years going through specific themes of her diary. Right. We did conversion, which that won an award. We did um, a book on Holy Souls in Purgatory and right. her devotion. Um, and, uh, and we did, um, there was three, conversion, adoration, and the Holy Souls. Um, and I thought that was it, but there's, there were other themes, Father, that I discovered. So um, what we have now, we have, I decided, okay, we need to have a comprehensive introduction to the diary. We need to have something for people that have read the diary and didn't know how to apply it. Mm -hmm. And we need to have something for people that haven't read the diary, you know, that mm -hmm. can learn and again, apply it. Sort of whet their appetite. Yes, exactly. Because when when we did this, we it, it, it gives you maybe a little incentive to go read about the particular themes. And that's what I found, Father. There were six key themes that were repeated over and over and over again um, that came up. And I thought, these are the key themes um, that we have to include. And they were adoration, um, they were confession, holy communion, love of God, God's will, and there's always the sixth one that I can't remember. I have to cheat, give me a second. Oh, of course, the one that has been on my mind, the dying. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah. so we, yeah, yeah, yeah. we walked through um, and, and we came up with some very um, eye-catching and uh, analogies that were contemporary to our times. And what I wanted to do tonight was walk through these themes with you and give you an example of how we are help, we try to help you apply them. Okay. So. I, I tell you, Father, I, it was just fascinating to do this. I really, uh, I'm just thrilled that um, I had the opportunity to do it with Sophia Press. So here is the first one, Holy Communion. And, and the format basically, Father, is her, her passage and our reflection and a prayer. Mm -hmm. And so the, the number, this is January 8th, the most solemn moment of my life is the moment when I see, receive communion. Mm -hmm. Okay, then our reflection is, is one synonym for solemn is awe-inspiring. That fits what St. Faustina is describing. Solemn isn't a word we use very often to describe our everyday lives. Society in general has become much more casual, but receiving our Lord in the Eucharist, which can happen daily as well as weekly, isn't meant to be casual, shouldn't be casual. If we prepare for that moment, if we pray about that event, if we step forward knowing we are about to receive the second person of the Blessed Trinity and our Savior, it will be profound. It can be the most solemn moment of our life. Yeah, it, there's always a risk. Sometimes I think about the risk that lifelong Catholics have of becoming like the people of Nazareth. They became so familiar with Jesus that he couldn't evoke faith from them. There was that, that certain kind of over familiarity that makes you think, well, I already got this. I understand it. I don't, what else is there to know? And she knew how little she knew. And the experience of receiving communion was solemn and profound. Ab absolutely, Father. Um, there was another one on Holy Communion. One more I just want to share. And it's in March, March 4th. And we, we, everything is original, original titles, original prayers and reflections. And we title it, Touch Me, Heal Me. And this is what she said. When I receive Holy Communion, I entreat and, and beg the Savior to heal my tongue that I may never fail in love of neighbor. And our mm -hmm. reflection is time and again, the gospels tell of crowds pushing in to get closer to Jesus, to touch him or even the hem of his garment. In Holy Communion, he comes to us one to one. And for a moment in the Eucharist, he rests on our tongue, the same tongue that can be used for words that praise him and encourage others, 
or can spew meanness. Our choice. Yeah. And, you know, that kind of reflection, uh, March is appropriate, of course. Um, you know, we're coming up in just a couple of weeks to the celebration of Holy Thursday and the institution of the Eucharist. And this would be the kind of reflection that all of us should be there. We, sh we need to be there for the Holy Thursday and Good Friday and Easter. And to enter into this with this kind of reflection from St. Faustina will enrich our experience of receiving communion and understanding the origins of the Mass. That's what we wanted to do, yeah. and you confirmed it. That was our hope. Um, and, she, and what we did, Father, um, was I did it liturgically. So during the months of March and April, um, actually maybe February, March, April, she, we take you through Lent and her experiences, we take you through um, uh, Easter, and we take you through Divine Mercy Sunday. Mm -hmm. So you can, you don't have to, you know, I'm not really a day-by-day -day person. I'm a person, I'll read the whole book. Mm -hmm. um, so if people are worried about, you know, being disciplined day by day, you do, Faustina wasn't measured by days. She was measured mm -hmm. by insight, her advice, um, her experiences. And that's what we wanted to get across. You really don't necessarily have to go day by day. You can go to March and you could read through March. Um, uh, so we're, we're happy that we were able to adjust that too. But you, you know, it's happy as an author to hear what, what we were trying to convey and you actually, you nailed it. Yeah, yeah this is a very important yeah. uh, element for us uh, to have because it's not only that we're getting ready to celebrate the Triduum of Holy Thursday, Good Friday and Easter, but then the week after is Mercy Sunday. And this is also a good preparation as we move toward that celebration as well. Right, and another big theme, Father, was confession. Mm -hmm. And I had to chuckle because I watched Mother Angelica for many years and it, it came back to me. She kept saying, go to confession, go to confession. Yes. So I just wanna um, share what, um, what she said about confession and what we titled it. We titled it Confession, Don't Leave Earth Without It. So uh, this is uh, and, uh, this is what we. I'm just gonna. I'm not gonna read everything Faustina said. I'm just gonna give you a little highlights for her for her for her own revelations. You can read it in detail. But basically, she said, I nestled close to the most sacred heart of Jesus with so much trust that even if I had the sins of all the damned weighing on my conscience, I would not have doubted God's mercy. But with a heart crushed to dust, I would have thrown myself into the abyss of your mercy. I believe, O oh Jesus, that you would not reject me, but would absolve me through the hand of your representative. Mm -hmm. And the reflection is, of course, today's quote is a strong endorsement for the sacrament of confession. Even if the sins of all the damned weighed on St. Faustina's conscience, she had no doubt divine mercy would forgive it all through the hand of her representative at a parish near you. Yep. Yep. Now, uh, one other thing I noticed, thing. Father, and you can comment being a confessor, the um, catechism, I like what the catechism said, that it's called the sacrament of conversion, the sacrament of forgiveness, and the sacrament of reconciliation. Mm -hmm. And you know, something that uh, I think that this speaks to is the opposite of the attitudes of our world. Right now we see not only a, the two different political parties, but even within the parties, people are more willing to confess the sins of their political opponents. <laughs> You'd almost think they were married to each other. <laughs> and they use this as a weapon, and then the response is, well, I didn't mean to harm anybody, I didn't mean to offend, I didn't know it, right? Right. Whereas confession is the place where you can say, Blessing Father, I have sinned. It's not that I got caught sinning and I don't have an excuse. I have sinned and, I'm, and I ask God's mercy. This is the opposite of the world. And then they criticize the Catholic Church for having confession. Why do you go to a priest? It's better to go to a priest than CNN. <laughs> <laughs> How far off is that? 
So this is something that we have to, you know, have a, a great sense of that there's mercy to be found. I, I like to see the confessional as being like that, that door, the set of doors at the bottom of the cross. And Very that you're nice. coming to Calvary to hear Jesus say to you, Father, forgive them. They know not what they do. That's what you're coming there. That's and a beautiful hear, analogy. And to hear that, that I absolve you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That's really one and not this other nonsense. And that's the start of conversion, Father, yeah, is confession. Exactly. And you know, people need the anger. Um, I, there's so much anger, Father, in, in our country. And someone asked me, how, how is she, you know, how does she relate to us in our day? And I was um, uh, talking to one of the Marians, and when you think about it, Father, that she, it wasn't popularized when she was um, when she was writing the diary. Oh, no. We, we no. didn't right. We didn't we didn't hear about it. No. And so what I was thinking after listening to this, she was really really you can say she was meant for our time. Yes. Um, um, and she really is giving us a path to follow. You know, she's saying, do the will of God. You know, forgive. As a matter of fact, I would, I think it's poignant that she died 11 months before the Germans invaded her homeland of Poland. And as the, the people of Europe experienced modern mercilessness, the lack of mercy that was shown to the 55 million people that died in the war mm -hmm. and the uh, a, a couple hundred million killed by the communists, that, and then hundreds of millions aborted. That the mercilessness is being, you know, uh, an, God's response of mercy. Speaking of responses, you had somebody write the forward to this book. Oh yes, sir. and we have him online, oh. Bishop Olmsted. Hello, Father Mitch. I'm fine. Good to hear from you. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. How are uh, you doing? I'm well, thank you. This is Bishop Olmsted from the Diocese of Phoenix, Arizona. And did you have any comments about this book for which you wrote a foreword? Well, I'm so grateful for Susan to, uh, for putting this together, especially the bite-size, <laughs> day-by-day mm -hmm. way of doing it. Right. Because for many of us, uh, it's, an, it's a book that you can just turn to maybe with your midday prayer or uh, with, you know, carry in your car to take out for five minutes in the heavy traffic or something. <laughs> I, I, it's it's a, just a great aid. And, and I really think that the Divine Mercy devotion is, is so helpful to people today. It certainly is in my own life. Mm -hmm. And I think it is for many people. For me, I love the way that it connects with the great mystery of Jesus in the Eucharist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, you know, and this is um, the kind of thing that, you know, by writing a foreword, did you have any comments about the bishop's foreword? Oh, it was outstanding because he narrowed in on what was the most important thing she did, and, and Bishop could comment was her prayer life. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, that uh, and calling us to the same kind of prayer life. Uh, do you have any other comments on that, uh, Bishop Olmsted? Well, you know, I think her example of constant prayer yes. <laughs> in the very, very mundane daily struggles of living in a convent. I mean, times of monotony, times of, of being misunderstood by superior or someone in the community. Um, but that's the way all, I mean, all of us have to learn how to be in touch with the Lord Jesus throughout our day, uh, surrendering as beloved children to a father who loves us when we were distracted in many ways. So I think we can relate to St. Faustina. She's, she's very real about suffering and, and about the daily kind of things that could get in the way mm -hmm. of surrendering to him or even listening to him. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Another key point he mentioned, that's what attracted me to her, is she's so relatable. She mm -hmm. had her struggles, she had her frustrations. Um, she said being in the convent was, you know, not being with angels. Um, and there was, there was one, um, well, just two things. I wanted just to add a little more about the prayer. 
because he really that's what that's the that's where it all begins father and of course the prayer is what the mass is the highest form of worship the highest act of prayer but um faustina said this about prayer she said a soul which is pure she said a soul arms itself by prayer for all kinds of combat in whatever state the soul may be it ought to pray a soul which is pure and beautiful must pray or else it will lose its beauty a soul which is striving after, the pure, after this purity must pray, or else it will never attain it. A soul which is newly converted must pray, or else it will fall again. A sinful soul plunged in sins must pray so that it might rise again. There is no soul which is not bound to pray, for every single grace comes through the soul through prayer. And, and I think that this is one of the risks that people become so busy they think, well, I don't have time to pray. And my work is my prayer. That was real popular back in the 60s and 70s. And that was dumb as a box of rocks. <laughs> you know, that, it, there was it, also in the box of rocks that were, remember, yeah. you buy a rock? Yeah, yeah, that's right. They sold rocks they sold in rocks. the box. <laughs> <laughs> We had I never them at bought one. We I had didn't have pet rocks. We used them as paperweights. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but this, but but this uh, issue of prayer is absolutely key. And um, do you, do you, besides in your own life, do you see that having a good effect on the people of your diocese, Bishop Altonstead? Yes, I'm. I'm finding more and more people praying mm -hmm. uh, the Divine Mercy Chaplet. Yes, I find it more and more popular. Uh, for me, it's especially uh, helpful when I'm really tired, <laughs> yeah. um, and when I, it's hard for me to think of something. But just the repetition, you know, of of those beautiful phrases, um, I, where, you know, whereas like the, the meditating on the mysteries of the Rosary, it takes a little bit more alertness, I would say, to stay with the uh, the mystery that you're focused on. But if you're really tired, just calling upon on the mercy of God uh, and you know then the, the ending it with it, Jesus I trust in thee that's, that's such a great way to end a prayer and commend uh, whatever is happening in our day to the Lord with, with that deep sense of trust mm -hmm. as his beloved child there was one other comment Bishop Olmsted and again I have to thank you from the bottom of my heart Bishop for your support you've just been phenomenal and a great example uh, to us but you commented about where she was normal and had frustrations, and um, and I just wanted to share about about that because uh, there we had a, a quote that that um, she talks about um, how sweet it is to live in a convent among sisters. But I must not forget that these angels are human are in human bodies, um, and so uh, she she there was another quote we had. What our reflection is there was a reflection we talked about what. I love humanity, but it's people I can't stand. Yeah, right. It's being able to be able to cope. And Mother Angelica had this uh, this quote. Um, a woman told her, she said, um, she said, if it weren't for these people, I would be holy. Yeah. It, but, but so it's be, she taught us. She really the diary, um, her examples, her advice, her input were phenomenal um, mm -hmm. and very everyday things. In fact, she uh, basically she said, be mild in your judgments. And, and in our terms, we put in the reflection, be cool, you yeah. know. Um, because again, because of the anger, we have to learn how to forgive. We have to learn how to um, forgive ourselves. Uh, we, we have to learn how to be merciful to others and to ourselves. And we have to learn how to share disagreements without being disagreeable. Mm -hmm. And she gives us that path. Yeah, I oftentimes think that the Divine Mercy Chaplet is a great way to pray for people with whom you have difficulties. Usually we have more than one person in our life. And you can do a decade uh, for each different individual as you pray the chaplet. Well, Bishop Olmsted, did you have anything else you wanted to add? You know, one of the things that strikes me, I, I had the privilege of working with John Paul II for nine and a half years, and I know he had a deep love for divine mercy. Yeah. Uh, you know, having written the encyclical Divas and Misericordia and all. Mm -hmm. So I, I love the fact that um, that she, she has one quote there, I think, uh, what delights, what a delight it is to love with all the force of one's soul and to be loved even more in return. Um, you know, in his first encyclical, John Paul talked about man cannot live without love. He remains an enigma to himself mm -hmm. if he doesn't discover love and make it his own. 
and uh, I think that's that's he was inspired and, and encouraged by by Saint Faustina's uh, delighting in being loved by God and receiving His love in return. Well, um, thank you very much, Bishop Olmsted. I appreciate uh, you uh, calling in, and you know um, we'll we'll hopefully have you back up here again too. I uh, always would be happy to join you. Thank you for the great work you're doing, and, and Susan, thank you for thank your you, Bishop. Work. Excellent. Thank you. You know, something that I always like remind myself too is uh, the first time I went to Wagivniki, where Saint Faustina had lived. I went to the place of her burial before they moved her uh, body into the chapel, uh, but she was buried with the other sisters in the cemetery. It was on a little knoll, and from that knoll you can look across a set of railroad tracks over the quarry where young Karavoitiwa was forced to do slave labor for the Third Reich. Mm -hmm. the, the Germans made him and other people do labor for some chemicals at the Solvein um, uh, quarry. And it's just over there, and it's almost as if she had her eye on mm -hmm. him. You know, of course, she was passed away, but, you know, there's the, yeah. just that sense. Well, and providence. he would pass through the, the convent property on the way back home every day, on the way home from work. So I thought that was a fascinating thing. Um, I have to say one more, he really hit on something, actually one of my favorite passages about, um, he quoted it very well, uh, Faustina talked about, this is what really um, shocked, surprised me the most, Father, doing the diary. Um, as I was writing and going through the diary, over and over again, she would talk about God's love and God's love for you and how he, how he loved you. And he quoted um, the passage was, what a delight it is to live with all the force of one soul and to be loved even more in return, to feel and experience this with the full consciousness of one's being. There are no words to express it. And this is what we said, thunderstruck, dumbfounded, a jaw-dropping speechlessness. As St. Faustina says, there are no words to express this. This being the realization that no matter how completely she loved God, he loved her even more in return. The same is true for us. No matter how much we may love someone, no matter how much we may love God, his love for them and for us is infinitely greater right. and personal one to one. Yep. Well, thank you very much for having done this kind of labor. Uh, and what we'd like to do is take a little break right now and open up for your questions and your comments. So please stay with us. Thank you much. Thank you so much. And we already have somebody on the line. Father Joe Roche, how are you? Good. How are you? Fine, thanks. You are the Vicar General of the Marians of the Immaculate and Immaculate Conception, Conception. and you all are the uh, priests who are at the Shrine of Divine Mercy, correct? That is correct, yes. Oh, great. And Father, what is your comment? Well, uh, I love Susan's book. Uh, you know, it just gives us a chance to each day reflect on the beautiful divine mercy of God. Uh, Susan has done a wonderful job. She's done so many wonderful things for the souls in purgatory, asking us always to remember to pray for them, which is one of our important charisms in our community. 
And so she's trying to do this for divine mercy. She's trying to give us that daily formation that we need to know how much God loves us, to know how much he cares for each one of us. And that's what we, we've got, we need in this world today. Everybody's so confused, and we just need to know that God is there. He loves us. He wants to pour out his mercy on us, and he wants to give us his love. So I'm just so happy that this book has come out, and I hope everybody will get a chance to see it. Uh, Father Joe, you're usually living in Rome. Are you in Rome right now? Well, I'm in London right now. I'm visiting our men in uh, London to see how they're doing up here. Okay. And uh, it's interesting right now with Brexit and everything that's going on. But, uh, uh, you know, God, God wants to pour out his love for everyone everywhere. Yeah, they're not going to kick you off because of Brexit, are they? <laughs> I'm supposed to go back to Rome on April 12th, and that's D-Day for them to decide everything. So it's interesting to see what's going to happen. <laughs> all right, well, be careful. Don't get mixed up with the European Union and all that. But uh, right. it's, Amen. It's, yeah. it's good to hear from you, though. Thank you very Thank much you. for your comments. All right. Thank you. For All my love. He, he was just a great inspiration working on, on the book, uh, Father Mitch. And he says the same thing that I was picking up, that, that the message of love and mercy is for our time, that, you know, mm -hmm. God is not trying to take pleasure out of the wicked. He wants yeah. us to convert and, and, and to live. Yeah, yeah. God, God doesn't enjoy he, exactly. catching sinners and exactly. saying, gotcha, you're going to fry. Yeah. yeah. No, or, no, or, or no, Father, no. he doesn't, he doesn't, I'll take it one step. He doesn't say in pur you know, for purgatory, it's not, I've doomed you completely or I'm done with you. Uh -huh. He's trying to prepare his unprepared children to stand before him. So yeah. it's a cleansing. Right. It's not a punishment. It's a purification. Yeah. Yeah, God willing. <laughs> Ma'am, yes. where are you from? I'm from Melbourne, Florida. Great. Good to have you here. Thank and you. Your question? Susan, my question is, can you please speak to us about how St. Faustina talks about the sick and the suffering? Oh, that's an excellent question. In fact, it's, um, you're one of her favorites, the sick and the suffering. There's two powerful passages that we, in fact, I dedicated the, to the book to the sick and the suffering, mm -hmm. um, Father. They're, they're my heroes. And, and, and this, is, um, this is what she says. She said, in suffering, we should see Jesus Christ and not a loafer or a burden on the com community. A soul who suffers with submission to the will of God draws down more blessings on the whole convent than all the, works, all the working sisters. God often grants many and great graces out of regard for the souls who are suffering, and he holds many punishments solely, he, he withholds many punishments solely because of the suffering souls. And this is our reflection, because she was specifically talking about convents. However, today St. Faustina has a message for you. If you're sick, elderly, disabled, or frail, you are a spiritual powerhouse for others. Those who are healthy and strong rely on you far more than any of us can possibly know or imagine. Out of his regard for you, God often grants many and great graces to your family, friends, parish, and neighborhood. Your power and influence are worldwide like no other. I, I think that that is so important. I know that there are a lot of our viewers who write to us saying that they can't get to Mass. They're homebound because sometimes age, sometimes illness, sometimes very serious illness. Um, and you know, this is uh, important for them to understand uh, the message of St. Faustina that their suffering is not without meaning. Again, the world wants to say, well, look, we'll show you mercy, we'll kill you. <laughs> Yeah. And that's, uh, th it's yeah. mercy killing they want to yeah. do. Yeah. And, and frankly, I don't believe them. They don't want to pay for the health care bills. Mm. That's, for, uh, that's what it comes down to. And, but they call it mercy. We don't want you to suffer. And we don't want to pay for your medicine. So you, you ought to just die. And this is all wrong. This is where that suffering is a gift that you can unite with Jesus. That's what the key. You join your suffering with that of Jesus Christ on the cross. And it is not meaningless. It has power. It has power. In this, in this 
very, and very she, problematic world. She called it magnificent gift, a magnificent gift. In fact, um, she took on sufferings for others. Mm -hmm. um, she said, if they don't want it, I'll take it. Just help me, give, give me the grace to be strong and, and make it meritorious. And so um, one of the passages we called it designated sufferer. Um, there's one other powerful passage for the sick and the suffering that um, really struck me, Father. And it's October 17th, and we called it No Fairy Tale. I saw that my suffering and prayer shackled Satan and snatched many souls from his clutches. That's how powerful it is. And then our, our reflection was, what an image, shackling and snatching from his clutches. It sounds like a fairy tale, except of course it's true. It's you who can snap on the shackles and snatch others from Satan. He's no fairy tale character. Frightening, yes. Invincible, no. It's you who have the power by offering up your suffering and prayers to help save countless souls. Yep. So that was her message yep. to the sick and suffering. And, and it that. still is today. She still yeah. prays for she prays for us, intercedes for us. No, thank you for that question. That was a good one. Young man, where are you from? I'm from Jackson, Michigan. Good to have you here. And what is your question? Well, you guys were talking about confession earlier, and I was wondering, when you come out of confession and the devil is tempting you to do the same sins over and over again, sure. what should you do? Do you want to take... But confession actually helps you with these kinds of behaviors. Mm -hmm. um, um, but, I mean, I'm just going to speak for myself. If you get tempted... I, you have friends, you have family, you have things that help you divert from this temptation. You don't go it alone. Yeah. I, I think, too, to, to keep in mind, sometimes, you know, when, for instance, common temptation. People speak badly of other people. They gossip. And it can become a habit. You just do it without thinking. And at times, it may seem like a very strong temptation, but it's not necessarily from the devil. It's from ourselves having a habit of having done the same thing over and over again. And so this is where we need help, you know, to find uh, something that is going to, uh, as a matter of fact, one psychologist put it this way, if you have a bad habit, it's like a record. I know you're young. You may not have ever seen a record. <laughs> a vinyl record. We used record. to see records with <laughs> grooves in them. And what you had to do, what you could do is scratch the record so that you're not playing the same thing again. You find something that is an alternative thought every time the, the temptation comes. Or uh, another example I like to use, you know, I... I, I Tell folks, I haven't eaten a donut since 1986. <laughs> because in 1986, I ate a donut, and it just sat there. <laughs> it did not burn up like it used to when I was younger. And when I think of donuts, I don't think, hmm, sweet, sugary dough. <laughs> no, no, no. I think, oh, it hurts. It's sweet, sugary dough. And it sits there. And, and I get a stomachache. And I don't want to feel like that. So I remember what it felt like after I ate the donut, rather than think about how good it is before I start to eat it. And that sometimes is a help. Think about how you feel after you commit sin, rather than how you feel, how, mm, this could be fun. No, you think about, this is how I feel. So that helps. that helps. We have Grant. Grant, where are you calling from? I'm calling from um, Huntley, Illinois. Oh. Wait Mrs. a minute, are you named after General Grant, Ulysses S. Grant? <laughs> no, I was not named after him. Okay, because he was from, he lived in Illinois too. He's from Ohio, but lived in Illinois. What's your question? So Susan was at St. Mary's Huntley um, about a week ago, and I was very excited to um, have her come to my church. I've, you know, heard okay. her several times. But my question was, um, I think a lot of young people should know this, what are indulgences, why should we earn them, and how can we obtain them? Okay, great questions. You'll have so, to help me along. Um, that's, that was very hard to explain in, in one of my books, the, mm -hmm. but um, 
it's not a discount, you know, Father. It, it's 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 a it's a means for spiritual growth, mm -hmm. um, and basically um, it remits the temporal punishment due to sin. So you go to confession, the guilt is removed, but the stain is still there. Mm -hmm. You have to remove the stain by corporal works of mercy, charity, um, uh, uh, the rosary, the mass. All these kinds of things help to to remit that temporal punishment. One of the ways, Father, that, and it's coming up soon, Divine Mercy Sun Sunday um, literally remits all temporal punishment on that day. So your soul is the way it was on the day you were baptized. Um, and I, I can't stress enough to take advantage of that. So, so we explain what an indulgence is. Now, mm -hmm. what was the other? Uh, how, what, do you, what are some of the ways you can get indulgence? Gain indulgence. Oh, mm -hmm. my goodness. There's a, um, E.W. Chan has this wonderful um, book called The Incredian of Indulgences, um, small book, and it lists all the kinds of prayers and practices that you, um, you, can, um, you can take advantage of. Uh, the rosary. In fact, for the souls in purgatory, Father, um, you, uh, the rosary and uh, the mass and adoration and the stations of the cross are, I call them the pillars of helping the souls in purgatory. Um, and because of the power of behind the mass, et cetera, but with the indulgence for, I mean, with the rosary and with the stations, it's the indulgences that are attached to it that help relieve the souls in purgatory. You have to be in the state of grace too when, you, when you're trying to help souls in purgatory. But, but there is a book that gives you all the kinds of um, prayers that are, or in pre devotions that you can, you can use to take advantage of. But those are some of them. Was yeah, there a third yeah, question, Father? Yeah, I, I think that that got it. I think they got everything. But in. you have to repair the damage of the sin. Right. I liked what right. Bishop Sheen said. It's like a hole in the wall, you know, the damage there, but you have to fill the hole up with, you know, good right. works and you have to repair it. Right. And, you know, I, I think um, uh, I want, you know, I had a heart attack three years ago, and one of the things I needed to do right away is start to walk and then increase that every day. And that that repaired a lot of the damage. The now, muscle. it also took an effort. And, and to think of the indulgences as repairing damage to your, your heart spiritually, not the physical organ, but the spiritual aspect of your heart, you take these exercises that repair damage done by the sins we commit. And that might be another way to look at it. And I think, you know, indulgences have gotten a bad rap. Um, they, they haven't gone away. And I think, um, I think it was John Macias, you know, he, he got greedy for indulgences. You know, he took every advantage he could to help, um, you know, gain indulgences for himself. And, and for the souls in purgatory. You, on Divine Mercy Sunday, Father, you can apply that, um, you know, there's two things from my understanding you get. You get a, an indulgence that was granted by John Paul, uh, and I was at that canonization on Divine Mercy Sunday, but also there's the promise. Jesus promises that anyone who goes to Mass, um, confession, receives communion on that day, all temporal punishment is removed. So you, you can take that indulgence and apply it to a soul in purgatory or all the souls in purgatory, somebody special, you're not going to lose it. You know, God is not stingy. No, you know, he, you're, no. he, it's going to come back to you a hundredfold. Yeah, you share. You share. <laughs> Ma'am, what can we do for you? Um, I have a special uh, question. Is there a particular special lesson that you have learned from reading the diary. The diary. Um, actually, that's a good question. The lessons um, were in the introduction. Uh, what she was trying to teach us to do, how to become holy, how to, um, if I, oh, here, how to grow closer in the Eucharist. See, the key themes were there. How to get along with others. I, there were so many amusing things that, you know, weren't amusing, but her struggles, even when she was in church and somebody was making a lot of noise, um, you know, you want to, you know, or coughing, you want to say, hey, pass the cough drops, but and she could have gotten up and left and she didn't. Um, her secrets to sanctity, what, what were they? Um, you know, forgiving, the sacraments, the rosary, um, those are, the, those are the, the keys. Doing God's will was, you know, straight out of, uh, straight to heaven. You do God's will, that's how you avoid purgatory. Um, that was a major, major theme. Trust in God. So, um, they're, they're listed, all the lessons were listed here. One, Father, that I, I, I just, again, I told you before the break, the, the dying was so powerful that um, 
I brought this book because what happened was she, um, she had asthma and she mm -hmm. was suffocated at one point and almost died. So she was in this infirmary and she saw all these other people that were dying in different ways. Um, and it was, and Father uh, Bishop Holmes had brought up the chaplet. Jesus and the guardian angel told her to pray the chaplet. She wanted to pray the litany and she heard a voice say, pray the chaplet. She said the chaplet is very important for the dying. And then she went on to say, I even prayed for myself for my own death, and she prayed Psalm 130. And then she said, I prayed the prayers for the dying. Okay, then I move on in the diary, and sisters and I prayed the prayers for the dying. And then I thought, We're out. what are the prayers for the dying? Well, it just so happened, Father, we were at, at one of the shows I was on. We, my mom died in uh, 2002, and they wanted me to share what did I do to help my mother prepare for death. Mm -hmm. And in this book, Prayers, Promises, and Devotions, we have a section on what to do if somebody is sick, suffering, and dying, and what the prayers of the church are. And what's included is the apostolic pardon. Right. This, this book was also used, Father, by Jeanette's, um, her first husband, Anthony, that had died. This was the book that they prayed at his side. Mm -hmm. So we have prayers for the dying, but it's in a different book, um, prayers, promises, and devotions, and, right. I, and, and the apostolic pardon. You can maybe comment yeah, about that. Yeah, that a, a priest can give the, ap uh, the apostolic pardon, which is also confers a, a, a plenary indulgence right. for the person as they're dying. So um, they're dying, I could, it, it was stressed over 15 times how critical it is to pray for the dying. Yeah, yeah, that, that's an important element. Um, I, we have just a few seconds left. Father, where are you from? I'm from Germany, but I'm living in Cairo, Egypt. Great. And you have a quick question? Yes. Uh, if someone would approach to you and ask you, uh, I have no idea about Sister Faustina. What's her significance for today? All right, you oh. have about 10 seconds. 10 seconds. Her significance is the message of, of what? Mercy, mercy, love and mercy. Yeah. That's what the, the key things that uh, God was saying that was great, his greatest attributes. And before, if I have two seconds left, masses for the souls in purgatory, the Gregorian masses, the pious union of St. Joseph, we've talked about them. Right, That's right. what you want to do. Remember well, the masses. I was longer than two seconds, so I'm going to have to cut you off. <laughs> Okay. So we, I want, but I want to thank you oh, very much thank for you. being here. It was a delight. And want to be able to give a blessing to all of you. May Almighty God bless you with his mercy and keep you all your days, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we can bring Susan on here and all of our other guests as well as all the other programs only because this program is brought to you by you. Mother Angelica was inspired to have you keep us in between your gas bill, electric bill, and cable bill. We need that so we can pay our bills too. Thank you. God bless. Susan. <laughs>